the capitalist system, its economy, and the entire social and political order arising from it is incompatible with the development of human life. Under this system, economic activity necessary for mankind's development is not determined by human needs, but by profit, opening a yawning gap between what is possible and what is actually being done. Enormous strides have been made in medical science but even the most basic necessities for health, including test kits, protective gear, masks and respirators, are not available because society is, is organized according to the dictates of the corporate and financial profit system. The crisis has verified the essential foundation of the perspective of socialism, that society must be freed from the grip of the capitalist octopus and replaced by a newer and higher form of socio-economic organization. This perspective is not merely some theoretical postulate. It is being confirmed in the experiences of daily life of the mass of humanity. Now, you might say, but the coronavirus pandemic is a natural disaster. So how can capitalism be held responsible for its outcome? To be sure, the coronavirus outbreak had a natural origin, but its impact on society is determined by the economic and social relations at its base that find their expression in politics in the decisions made by governments. The coronavirus outbreak was a shock. It seemed to arrive out of the blue. I use the word seemed advisedly because for the past 20 years and more, there have been continuous warnings by experts in the field that the threat of pandemics was mounting as cities grew and the global population became more interconnected. In 2018, the World Health Organization warned of an unknown disease X that would arise from a virus originating in animals, emerging somewhere on the planet, where economic development drives people and wildlife together. Exploiting networks of human travel and trade, it would reach multiple countries and thwart containment. Disease X would have a mortality rate higher than a seasonal flu, but would spread as easily as the flu. It would shape financial markets even before it achieved pandemic status. Science journalist Laurie Garrett, who has devoted a lifetime researching these issues, warned two years ago that in such a pandemic, respiratory care was questionable and bed capacity was lacking because of cost cutting. That is exactly what has taken place. The cutting of vital healthcare and hospital facilities is not the result of a natural disaster, but the product of a definite socio-economic system. Let me briefly trace its main features as they have developed over the past four decades. In the course of the massive stock market plunge, there have been many references to Black Monday, October 1987. October 19, 1987. While that crash, the largest single day fall in history, did not have the same effects as the global financial meltdown of 2008 or the present crisis, it was nonetheless decisive. It marked a turning point that has led to the situation we are now in. Responding to the market crash, the then chair of the US Fed, Alan Greenspan, declared the money spigots of the central bank were now open to the financial system. This was not a one-off decision, but the start of a new era. The Fed determined that henceforth, its central policy was to come to the rescue of financial markets by pumping in still more cheap money when they failed. The outcome was the endless creation of financial bubbles. And when one bubble burst, the task of financial authorities 
was not to deal with the causes in order to prevent it happening again, but to make still more money available so that a new round of speculation could begin. Throughout the 1990s and into the present century, as regulation of the financial system was progressively dismantled, this led to a series of crises, each one more serious than the last. Then came the meltdown of 2008. The examination of that crisis revealed its most essential and fundamental cause, that is, the build-up of debt within the financial system. But what was the response? Central banks and governments around the world organized massive bailouts for the banks, whose criminal activities had helped spark the crisis in order to enable them to continue the very speculation and parasitism that had produced it. This was coupled with a deepening attack on the social position of working people around the world. Millions lost their jobs, wages were reduced, austerity cuts were deepened, resulting in massive cuts to health, education, and other social necessities. This was not the product of some mistake or wrong policy conception. It was rooted in the very process of financialization itself. The markets seem to be some kind of financial heaven in which money can simply beget more money, but ultimately they are tied to earth. In the final analysis, all financial assets are a claim on the underlying real economy. Above all, the surplus value extracted from the labor of the working class. This is why the rise and rise of financialization has been accompanied by stagnating or declining real wages and the gutting of social services, above all health, as the resources of society are siphoned to the upper echelons. These two processes, which have a causal, not an accidental relationship, have resulted in the greatest level of social inequality ever seen in human history. The Oxfam organization recently provided graphic details of this process. It noted that the world's billionaire population, just 2,153 people, control more wealth than the 4.6 billion poorest people. The top 1% collectively has twice as much wealth as 6.9 billion people, nearly the entire population of the world. Providing a graphic illustration, Oxfam said, if everyone were to sit on their wealth piled up in $100 bills, most of humanity would be sitting on the floor. A middle-class person in a rich country would be sitting at the height of a chair the world's two richest men would be sitting in outer space. The governments of all countries, whatever their political coloration, rule in the interests of this class. In the financial crisis of 2008, it could be said the ruling classes bared their teeth. Trillions of dollars were provided to the financial elites so they could continue to accumulate wealth hand over fist, while the working class had its living standards cut. However, there was one area that was spared, expenditure on the military, above all in the United States, but a policy followed around the Fair world. Enough. Testing cannot be carried out, hospitals cannot cope, but the US military machine receives almost $1 trillion a year. The teeth were bared in 2008. Now the fangs are being even more prominently displayed, ready to bite deeper into society. If you think I'm exaggerating, please take note of the following comments. Earlier this month, one of the chief advisors to the Johnson Tory government in Britain, Sir Patrick Vallance, insisted that the British government should not try to keep the coronavirus from infecting the public. 
it's not possible to stop everyone getting it, he said, and it's also not desirable. So far, we know that the death rates arising from the virus are highest among older sections of the population, especially those with underlying conditions. This indeed may prove desirable for the ruling elites. The British Telegraph columnist, Jeremy Warner, recently pointed to what is clearly being discussed in these circles when he wrote that COVID-19 might even prove mildly beneficial in the long term by disproportionately culling elderly dependent. This is not a slip of the pen. For a number of years, the ruling classes in all the major economies have expressed concern about what they call the burden placed on state pension system systems due to the fact that people tend to live longer. They have been discussing how it might be reduced so that still more of the resources of society can be diverted away from what Adolf Hitler once called useless eaters and channeled into the coffers of finance capital. And today, as Zach noted, we have the news that the Trump administration is considering winding back necessary health measures because of their impact on Wall Street. Yesterday, Trump tweeted, we cannot let the cure be worse than the problem itself. His economic advisor, Larry Kudlow, told TV interviewers, quote, at some point you have to ask yourself whether the shutdown is doing more harm than good. We are going to have to make some difficult trade-offs. A kind of calculus of death is being drawn up in which potentially millions die in order that the financial and corporate oligarchs can continue to accumulate profit. However, our picture of the world situation would be very incomplete, one-sided, and therefore wrong if we were to simply focus on the ever-mounting depredations of the capitalist system. Such an approach can only lead to the most pessimistic conclusions as people become overwhelmed by the great problems they face. But at the same time, it is also necessary to grasp that the means for the solution of these problems has also emerged. A new and more powerful force than the bankrupt and criminal capitalist class has entered the scene, particularly over the past two years. After decades of suppression at the hands of the political establishment and the trade union bureaucracies, the working class the world over is beginning to re-enter the arena of political and social struggle. There have been strikes and mass demonstrations involving hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions, in countries around the world. The shift in mass psychology is equally significant. Capitalism has once again become a dirty word. In every country, the political establishment is regarded as completely incompetent, unfit to rule, and viewed with growing hostility. There is a deepening be belief, fueled by life experiences from the cradle to the grave, that the system is rigged, that it functions solely as a means for increasing the wealth of the ultra rich. This growth of anti capitalist sentiment is being accompanied by an increasing interest in and support for socialism. There is a growth of pro socialist sentiment that will further develop. Millions of people are starting to think things they never thought of before, because in a series of explosive shocks, such as the coronavirus outbreak, they are being confronted in real life with conditions beyond their wildest imaginings. However, at this stage, there is no clear idea of what socialism actually is, and how to fight for it. There is a wide range of views. 
Some regard it as government intervention to regulate the activities of the corporations and finance capital and can curb some of their more voracious activities. That the existing state can somehow be reformed and made to act in the interests of society. Others view socialism favourably, but are concerned that such a system could turn into something akin to what existed in the Stalinized Soviet Union. Another view is that socialism is some kind of scheme drawn up by Karl Marx, which sounds very good, but is a utopia or pipe dream, impossible to carry out because of inherent problems in what is called human nature. I shall be seeking to clarify these issues in the course of the five lectures that we have and in answering the questions that I urge you to raise. Let me begin with a very important point made by the young Karl Marx at the age of just 25. The issue he insisted was not trying to construct out of our heads a society of the future. Rather, he wrote, there can be no doubt about the task confronting us at present, the ruthless criticism of the existing order, ruthless in that it will not shrink from its own discoveries, nor from the conflict with the powers that be. Such ruthless criticism reveals the utter bankruptcy of the capitalist system of which the coronavirus outbreak and its consequences are only the most egregious expression. The same conclusion emerges as we confront every other major issue. The fact that hundreds of millions of people are now on the point of being hurled into conditions akin to the Great Depression. The existential threat posed by climate change, which like the threat of pandemics, the ruling elites have refused to address and the ever growing and ever present threat of war. These clear and present dangers can only be met through society's producers, the working class, taking control of society. How then is that to be carried out? Let me cite another very important point made by Marx in the Communist Manifesto directed to this very question. Our theoretical conclusions, he wrote, are not the schemes drawn up out of the brain of some would-be universal reformer, but are the expression of processes going on under our very eyes. We must use this method to chart our course. It is clear that the coronavirus cannot be combated to individual action or the free market. Neither can it be resolved by ignoring it, hoping it will simply pass, and that and declaring that necessary health measures are just so much hype to be disregarded. The health crisis requires the mobilization of society's resources in planned and consciously coordinated action through the state. Likewise, on the economic front, the so-called free market has led to a disaster. This is not simply an assertion on my part. The capitalist class itself is screaming it from the rooftops. The system has broken down. The state, governments and central banks must intervene. How things have changed overnight. In the past, any, even mild programs for social reform were greeted with the response, there is no money. Now there is money everywhere for the corporations and financial markets. State organization of society is a necessity on both the health and economic fronts. But what kind of state is it going to be? Here we come to the crucial political questions of the day, not of some distant future, but arising directly out of the present crisis. If it is the state of the financial oligarchs, we know the outcome. 
the provision of still more money for the corporations and finance capital, leading to ever worsening conditions for the working class and the death of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions. And as social struggles develop, the ruling class will use state force, the military and police to enforce its dictates through authoritarian and outright fascist forms of rule. There are already clear signs of this in the use of the police and military to impose lockdowns and the like. State organization and control of society is a, is a necessity, but it must be exercised by a worker's state, democratically organized and controlled, which come control, which comes to power through a revolutionary struggle to overthrow the old order. How then do we proceed from the present situation to this necessary goal? The founder of our party, Leon Trotsky, set this out very clearly. In the founding document of our movement, he wrote of the need to develop a series of transitional demands. That is demands which address today's needs and the consciousness of wide layers of society, but which lead unalterably to the conquest of political power by the working class. Our party has advanced a series of such transitional demands regarding the health crisis, concrete measures to address it. They are grounded on two fundamental principles, that human need must predominate over profit and that the necessary measures undertaken are under the democratic control of the working class, that is, the whole of society. On the economic front, the banks, financial system and the major corporations must be taken into public ownership under democratic control. These giants are demanding untold billions of dollars from the state to bail them out so that they can continue their massive appropriation of wealth through the very same speculation and looting that has led to the present disaster. The commanding heights of the economy, the functioning of which determine the economic fate of everyone on the planet, cannot be left a moment longer in the hands of this gang of corporate criminals. Enough is enough. So I urge that you read and study our program on the World Socialist website, and above all, become active fighters for it and join our party in the fight for socialism. And to the younger members of this audience, let me say, you have a particular task. You have a crucial role in securing the future. Therefore, consciously set yourself against and fight some of the retrograde trends that have developed, that this is all hype only affecting the older generation. We say to the youth, as we said in our founding program, your fresh enthusiasm and aggressive spirit can ensure the turn of the older generation of workers to revolutionary struggle. So, in the words of a popular slogan of present times, seize the day, take up the challenges before you. We are confronting quite literally life and death issues. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation, Nick, and I think everyone will agree that it covered a number of, of issues and, and questions which have already started to come in. Um, so we have a number of questions that have come in online on a, a two main, I think, topics at the moment. Um, there's some questions directed specifically to the, the coronavirus um, and its implications, uh, which, you know, lead into some more fundamental questions, which all of which are important. I think um, one of the questions that's come in uh, is to ask why is it that 
it appears that Australians are not taking the pandemic seriously. Um, there's another question that asks whether or not schools um, should be shut down, um, whether a full lockdown should be implemented. Will that help to uh, stop the spread? Um, and, and a number of questions about the implications for uh, for uh, well, really, war um, and and uh, clashes between the imperialist powers and the great powers. Um, but I think so. There's a number of questions just directly on the issue of coronavirus. Maybe I think you could. Okay. Well, let me deal with it. Why do large numbers of people seemingly not take it seriously? Well, one of the reasons is that they have been provided with no accurate information. I mean, after all, the uh, President of the United States, the major uh, capitalist power in the world, just a, a few weeks ago, declared that it was a hoax, nothing to worry about. And it was, he called, the China virus that had been imported into the United States. The same applied to Prime Minister Scott Morrison, who follows Trump very closely. Just the weekend before last, he said, well, I'm off to the footy. We don't want to cancel it. I want to go and see the Cronulla Sharks. There's been no accurate information provided. There are no emergency measures being dealt with. And so people don't take it seriously. Let's draw a parallel. If this was a war emergency, we would see the whole resources of society being devoted to the production of weapons. But here is a question of life. Do we see emergency measures being directed to the production of necessary life saving facilities? Do we see commitments to reverse the massive cuts that have taken place in the health system? Do we see measures undertaken to supply the necessary testing kits, uh, protective personal equipment, respirators? Do we see factories being taken over and organized as they would be in wartime to produce such materials? No, nothing of the sort is taking place. And so in that situation, you have uh, some sections of the population consider, well, this is all just hype because there's no response and there's conflicting every day. There's conflicting uh, information provided. Yes, we, we insist that, that schools should be uh, shut down. Provision has to be made for, and this raises the vital question, about the organization of society as a whole. It's not just a question of shutting down a school. That raises all sorts of other questions. What about the, the children of people who are involved in essential services? You deal with schools and it, you deal, you're dealing with much wider questions, which can only be resolved and dealt with at a societal level. Schools should be closed, but teachers have to be paid. Compensation paid for uh, parents who have to stay at home. Where's that money to come from? Well, we say it has to come out of the coffers of the financial and corporate elites who have accumulated fabulous wealth and whose accumulation of that wealth has led to the situation where hospital systems in this country and internationally are completely unable to cope. The whole policies of the last period have to be reversed but we see nothing uh, like that. What are the implications for, uh, a question is raised about the implications for the conflict between the major capitalist powers. Well, we know what the outcome is going to be. We have already seen it. Like every crisis, every section of the ruling class organized in national states, the basis of their profit system, will seek to take advantage. We already saw that with the actions of Donald Trump seeking 
to intervene in Germany to ensure that a company preparing uh, vaccines and measures against the virus would direct its operations towards the United States. There is no coordinated response uh, from the major powers. They all act separately and individual, individually to uh, advance their own interests. And there's certainly going to be, and the uh, ex expressions of Trump make this clear. Nowhere is it more clear than in their actions against Iran. The United States having bankrupted the country's health system because of its sanctions is now seeking to make the situation even worse as it prosecutes its agenda to uh, overthrow the Iranian government and establish more powerfully its control in the Middle East. That's the reaction. We can see that developing on an international scale. Okay, we're getting a lot of questions in, um, which is excellent. And the one of the uh, questions, uh, or I guess uh, themes of questions, relates to the nature of both the working class and also, you know, what what would uh, society sort of be um, under socialism. So one of the questions is, who will be the rulers? Under socialism, are there going to be any rulers or, or will there be a new ruling class? Um, another participant asks or, or raises whether the working class is going extinct. Um, and then I think a, a, a related question is, how would the redistribution of wealth um, resolve the economic crisis coming out of this? So I guess questions relating to to the uh, the working class, the nature of a worker's state, and, and some of the measures that could be implemented. Well, let me just deal with the, some of those those issues. First of all, let's tackle this question that has been floated around in various circles, particularly among pseudo left circles, academic circles. The working class is becoming extinct. In fact, it's the opposite that's taking place. What do we mean by the working class? We don't simply mean workers who happen to be in a particular industry and carrying out a, particularly ki a particular kind of labor. That, that changes over time with the development of the productive forces. The working class in the 19th century was very different from the working class in the 20th century. Further developments of the productive forces make uh, change the way labor is carried out. Workers in a steel industry, for example, at one stage uh, stand, stood before blast furnaces. Now they operate on the basis of computer screens. Now, when we're speaking of the working class, we're speaking above all of social relations. The working class is that class which is compelled because it has no access to the means of production to sell the only commodity that it does have, labor power, its capacity to work, which has to sell that labor power to the owners of capital. Far from becoming extinct, that class has massively expanded. In fact, one of the greatest changes over the last 30 years has been in the expansion of this class. Take China, for example. Millions of peasants in that society have been transformed in the course of two, a generation into workers in industry selling their labor power to the giant corporations of the world, Foxconn, which makes Apple, Samsung, and so on. A whole urbanization of that society has taken place. And in the advanced capitalist countries, Whole sections of the population, which once were considered middle class, have become wage laborers in one form or another, including among the pro professional layers who can be hired and fired just like a worker in a factory. So the working class, far from becoming instinct, extinct, comprises the overwhelming mass of society on a world scale. 
and through its common labor produces all the wealth and resources of that society. Now a question asked is how would the redistribution of wealth from above solve this economic crisis? Well, it would put a stop to the looting of the resources of society, which has bankrupted in every country, the health system, rendered enormous cuts to the education system, cut social services and so on, and the list goes on. That's the source of the problem. We are, if we take the last 30 years, the productivity of labor has increased enormously on an unprecedented scale. We can do things now with relatively few numbers of people in the process that we can, which accomplish great tasks that uh, required huge numbers of people before. Productivity has increased. The resources of society has incre have increased. As I mentioned at the outset, enormous advances have been made in medical science, but we can't even get proper PPE equipment to the health system. The, the problem lies in how those resources are used and utilized. In the present system, they are used and utilized for the accumulation of profit, for the accumulation of wealth in the hands of a tiny layer which sits on top of society and rules it through whatever governments come to power, through a banking and financial system which demands and achieves the ever greater extraction of wealth from the labor of working people. Now, what would a socialist society involve? Would it involve a new ruling class? No, because the very nature of the working class to realize its interests, its historic interests, its immediate interests, is that it has to undertake the abolition of classes. This is the last form of class society. Mankind has lived for thousands of years in class society when there has been a ruling class and an exploited class, slavery, feudalism, and now capitalism. But capitalism is the highest and last form of this class society. So the coming to power of the working class would bring about the development, the advancement towards a classless society. Can that be achieved overnight and all at once? No. But the vital steps in initiating such a society can be developed to the establishment of a worker state based on democratic organizations of the working class that will arise in the course of the social struggles that are now uh, underway. A state in which you don't just vote once every three years for which member of the ruling class might rule over you, but a state in which everyone, as Lenin said, every cook must learn to be a governor. A state in which everyone is involved in the, dem in the making of the decisions which affect their lives. We don't live in a democracy. We live in the dictator under the dictatorship of finance capital. You don't get to vote if you're going to be sacked. You don't get to vote if you're going to get a wage rise. You don't get to vote if you are thrown out of your job next week. That's decided not by you, but by the processes of this system. So a socialist society would, be, would involve the democratic decision-making on political decisions, and the active involvement of the producers of all wealth, the working class, in, in deciding how that wealth should be allocated, how it should be used through a democratic discussion, involvement, and the making of decisions about its use. That's what it's necessary. That's what is necessary. And we begin, we don't just postulate that as some utopia for the future. The preparation of society must begin now. We say that the health measures necessary must be determined by the active involvement of the working class. 
the establishment of rank and file committees, organizations of workers, of doctors, of teachers, of workers in every workplace deciding upon what conditions are necessary for their safety, demanding what necessary measures must be introduced. In other words, the involvement of the working class itself in meeting this crisis and in that way developing the struggle uh, for the necessary forms of political organisation that will be needed to establish a worker state and genuine democracy, government of the people, by the people, for the people. Now we're getting a number of comments and questions about the prospect of job losses uh, as a result of coronavirus and, and, and what's coming out of it. Uh, one participant asks, what will happen if we all lose our jobs um, as a result of the coronavirus? Another asks, what are the economic implications of this pandemic? Are we heading into a depression? Um, another says, I've been devastated losing my job from this crisis. Is there any way possible that after this, the job mar market will skyrocket? Um, another says, do you think the current onslaught of layoffs and stand downs is the pretext for the ruling class to instill a more rapacious form of capitalism to prepare the working class for the coming recession or deeper economic depression and the cuts to follow? Questions along those lines. Let me deal with those. What are the prospects of uh, of job losses? We, there's no question uh, that uh, people the world over, workers the world over, are facing situations akin to the Great Depression. If uh, we could just cite a few figures on that. Uh, James Bullard, uh, over the weekend, a member of the Governing Council of the Federal Reserve in the United States, said he expected unemployment in the second quarter in the US to rise to 30%. Yesterday, we saw depression-like conditions emerge in Australia. Zach already mentioned the snake-like queues that ex extended for a couple of hundred metres at least around uh, Centrelink offices as people sought to register for unemployment benefit. And they were forced to do that, of course, because the uh, online system crashed. The authorities then said it was a result of a cyber attack. In fact, it was the result of the fact that the whole system uh, had been completely overloaded by the number of applicants. What happens if jobs are lost? Well, there's only one way uh, out of this. And uh, that's what earlier generations discovered. One has to begin the fight for a different social and economic system. We are now experiencing very directly the type of conditions which in the first part of the 20th century, in the World War, World War I, its aftermath and the Great Depression drove millions of workers the world over to seek a socialist solution, starting with the Russian Revolution arising in 1917 out of the catastrophe of World, World War I. You are now experiencing the conditions that led your forebears, great-grandparents, -grand great-grandparents and further back, to take the road of socialism all over the world. That struggle was betrayed, and we'll discuss this further next week, it was betrayed by the misleaderships of the working class, first social democracy, and then Stalinism. We have to ensure that on, at this juncture in history, those struggles which are going to emerge, which are emerging and developing, have at their head a conscious leadership, which, like the Bolsheviks in 1917, can lead the working class to victory. We have to win this time. 
It's a life and death matter. There's no economic mechanism within the capitalist order that is going to bring about some kind of, you know, revival. It's not to say that jobs may not come back. They will after this virus has passed in whatever form, but the situation is never going to be the same again. This is a turning point. We've crossed the Rubicon and we know from experience, historical experience and more recent experience that the outcome of this crisis on the part of the ruling classes will be to deepen their attacks on the working class. After all, draw the lessons of your most recent experience the crisis of 2008. Did that when the system collapsed because of the uh, complete criminal activity of the banking system, when the system collapsed because of the massive accumulation of debt that had occurred in the accumulation of profit? Was there an exam? And, and uh, it's not me that's saying that. Uh, you can go and study the 2011. A report of the Senate Committee in the United States, which basically, and this was not work done by the senators, but by some uh, diligent members of staff, who established, as, the, in they, as they put it, the financial system was a snake pit of vipers, conflicting interests abound. You read the, the report and you can only conclude that Goldman Sachs and other investment banks are criminal operations. But was anything done to alleviate that situation, to rectify it? No. Firstly, did anyone go to jail for their criminal activities? No. The banks, it was declared, were too big to fail, and the chief executives who were responsible were too important to jail. That's what happened. And what came out of 2008 was a deepening assault on the working class the world over. Wages were reduced, new forms of exploitation were developed, the so-called gig economy, no contract uh, working, all of the measures that have been developed which affect so directly millions of young people around the world, all of that was intensified. And as I said, austerity programs were directed to vital social services, to privatization, direct cuts, uh, and so on. Now, out of this crisis, if that was the result of 2008, we can expect, and we are already seeing, ever deepening attacks are going to emerge uh, by uh, the ruling classes. And of course, their military preparations and uh, police state measures are very much, uh, are very much part of that. So is this, a, is this a pretext? Well, they operate according to the maxim developed by Ralph Emanuel, one of Obama's advisors, never let a good crisis go to waste. Because in a crisis, you can do things that you were thinking about doing, but were not possible in so-called normal circumstances. But in a crisis, you can do them. And one of the aspects, of course, which the ruling classes have been discussing, has been the development of ever more authoritarian forms of rule. And we see that most clearly, of course, in the jailing, the extradition, the attack on Julian Assange for publishing accurate information and truth about the war plans of US imperialism. The rule book has been torn up. There's no democratic rights. But what is being done against Assange is what the ruling class has in store for the rest of the uh, rest of the population. Development of authoritarian and fascist forms of rule. Yes, so those measures are going to be developed and intensified because the ruling class knows and they are conscious. One of the great problems of society is that the ruling class is more conscious of what's going on than the working class is. We have to raise the consciousness of the working class to the great dangers that face it. But the ruling class is very conscious. They have seen over the last two years the eruption of social struggles from one end of the world to the other. And they know that that's the situation, that social explosion 
is will erupt sooner rather than later in all the major capitalist countries and so they must make their preparations for it and they are certainly developing the authoritarian forms of rule necessary to combat it and deepen their dictatorship. We've got a question from a little bit further back, but it's it's very direct in, in terms of raising the issue of transitional demands. Uh, what, the, what the participant asks is, uh, or says is, firstly, thank you for discussing transitional demands. How do we distinguish these decisive, um, these decisively from the pseudo left project of reform and therein catch out the demands of reform rather than the demands that reflect the interest of the working class. How do we determine or identify the key distinctions between a program of socialist transitional demands as espoused by the SEP and the demands put forward by the pseudo left? What is the essential distinction? Um, there are also, there's also another question which is somewhat related, uh, but I think it, it feeds into it. It notes, capitalism stifles medical practice with useless competition. What could a global socialist government do to heed pandemics? Um, and, and another one, um, which is raising the question of revolutionary theory, uh, says, don't you think revolutionary theory is obsolete in the 21st century? Uh, that the time of violence and revolution is a bygone era. Hence, how will effective transfer of power become reality, become a reality, given the power okay. of modern surveillance, policing, and of course the media? So right. those okay. Yeah, questions. Okay. Um, well, first of all, um, hang on, I'm just trying to... Uh, oh, yeah, the distinction. Well, there's a very clear distinction. The... Uh, First of all, the pseudo left have got virtually nothing to say. They don't raise any demands in relation. I had a look at Red Flag the other day. Uh, there's an article by one of their leading so called theoreticians, Rick Kuhn. He basically says, look, there's ups and downs in the economic cycle. This will pass. There'll be a new upsurge of economic development and so on. No demands are raised. Now, the issue is the following. Out there, insofar as they issue demands, it's aimed at trying to put pressure on the capitalist ruling class to say that the state, the capitalist state, can somehow be reformed. We've had the most glaring example of this kind of process just taking place now in the United States. All the pseudo left organizations in the United States. International Socialist Organization, formerly existing a, till a year ago, all have rallied behind the candidacy of Bernie Sanders for presidency. Sanders puts forward not a social, revolutionary socialist program, although he used to call for political revolution, but a series of fairly mild economic reforms, but they are all directed and based upon to the Democratic Party and on the assumption that the capitalist state can somehow be reformed and that the Democratic Party, the oldest capitalist party in the world, could some, the party that had its origins in the slaveocracy, can somehow be transformed into the instrument for socialism. Now we'll be discussing that, uh, that issue more directly in one of the upcoming lectures, but that whole perspective has been refuted. We had a similar experience in 2015 in Greece when the pseudo left organizations around the world, Socialist Alliance in this country, Socialist Alternative, all hailed the coalition of the radical left, Syriza in Greece. This was going to carry out a massive transformation and so on. And of course, what happened? The Greek people voted in, uh, was it July of 2015? No, by 60 odd, 63 percent against the austerity measures of the European Central Bank. The Syriza government rejected that vote and carried out the austerity demands. 
we were the only tendency internationally which warned the working class about what this organization was. Now, our transitional demands are not directed to the reform of the capitalist state. They're directed to, they're the means for the mobilization of the working class. That is around those demands through the development, not of demands to the state, but through the development, we fight for their implementation through the development of independent action by the working class, the formation of its own independent organizations to carry them out, the establishment of workers' control in the factories, the establishment of control by teachers in the schools to regulate what's going on, to determine what's going on. We just don't say close the schools, we say teachers have to determine what takes place, what is a safe working environment. And at every point, to challenge the domination of the state bureaucracies and so on. So that's the, the fundamental difference. Our demands are directed to the systematic mobilization of the working class. Now, the, sorry, the other question you had there, Zach, what was the, what? Um, oh yes, the question, of, the question of medical science. Yeah, very important issue. Um, we have in all the sciences and in particular medicine, the, what can, how can I put it? The destructive effects of capitalist property relations. There are a number of aspects to this and uh, I'll try and go through them. One of the reasons we don't have uh, proper investigation of viruses and the development of responses to meet the problems of the immune system or the development of the immune system, that is the development of vaccines, is that this is not profitable. The health industry is largely in the hands of, almost in, entirely in the hands of major pharmaceutical companies and others. The development of science requires above all the free exchange of information. The fundamental principle was enunciated by uh, Isaac Newton. As he said, if I have seen further, it is because I have stood on the shoulders of giants. That is, the development of science requires the free exchange of information for one scientist's discoveries to be made freely available to others, for a breakthrough in one area, to become the common property of the scientific community. So that out of this collective labor, collective scientific work by individuals around the world, new solutions can be developed, old problems can be resolved and so on. What happens now? You make a discovery, and the university or institution you're in immediately files for a patent to prevent such discovery because it must be subordinated to the interests of profit. And the university says, well, we have to do this because we're dependent on funding. Because government funding is cut, we're dependent on funding from these corporations to continue our activity. So the very basis of science is broken up. It's a kind of intellectual feudalism, barriers, obstacles erected to prevent the necessary free exchange of information uh, which can advance scientific development. So the uh, abolition of capitalism, the abolition of private ownership of health, of resources. I mean, they even tried to, when the genome was uh, discovered or when the genome was, um, you know, elaborated. I mean, various sections try to patent the DNA. If you discover a certain section of DNA, if you discover uh, what may cause in the DNA, may cause a certain disease, and you discover that, then you rush off to get a patent for it and to make billions to the pharmaceutical companies, the pharmaceutical companies do, to make billions out of it uh, in marketing drugs based on that scientific discovery. Um, but of course, all, and this is a complete corrupt uh, system, because all of these discoveries in science depend upon 
public ownership. The research, research has been conducted by through generations, you know, that which have been publicly, uh, you know, developed through institutions, the results of which are then appropriated by pharmaceutical companies, big research companies, and so on, uh, in profit to the detriment of scientific uh, advance. So the uh, development of, uh, uh, you know, the, the development of socialism would see an enormous flowering of uh, scientific advance because every scientist would be un understanding and those involved that through their discoveries, that their discoveries were going to be made and developed for human use and human necessity. You say uh, the question I asked, well, revolution is outdated. The uh, power of the state is really too big, too impossible, too powerful, can't be overthrown. So what can we do? Well, we don't share that conception. The working class is the most powerful force in the world. The working class acting can bring down and has brought down um, governments around the world. I mean, let's take what happened, the, the most recent experience that we saw uh, in particularly in Egypt in 2011, a revolution that was sparked, and this is one of the reasons why Julian Assange is in jail, a revolution that was sparked by revelations on WikiLeaks, which provided the masses of Egypt with information. In three days, in uh, February of 2011, the country was paralyzed by a general strike uh, which brought down the Mubarak government. Now, that didn't br bring about socialism and the Egyptian working class was betrayed and dictatorship has returned. The reason for that was not the lack of power by the working class. That power was demonstrated in spades and people around the world recognized it. It took place, for example, under conditions uh, where uh, there was a, a very sharp upsurge in with the state of Wisconsin and the US. And uh, workers who besieged the state capital were talking about walk like an Egyptian, down with the pharaohs. It was a sentiment expressed around the world. The problem in Egypt was not the lack of power of the working class. The problem in Egypt was not the power of the capitalist state. And we're talking about a country whose state is backed by United States imperialism. That was not the problem. The problem in Egypt and the reason for the setback of that struggle was that the Egyptian working class lacked a revolutionary leadership and so once again, the situation was able to be brought under, at least temporarily, uh, the control of the bourgeoisie. The problem is not the lack of power of the working class. The problem we face, and as Trotsky explained so well in our founding program, the crisis of mankind can be reduced to the crisis of revolutionary leadership. The working class does not yet have at its head a revolutionary leadership which has a clear perspective and program worked out to deal with this situation. That's what we have to build. That's the struggle that the IYSSE, the SEP, the World Socialist website is dedicated to resolving. There are a number of comments uh, that have been sent in and, and shared in the chat field. I mean, one of them also notes on the importance of the defense of Julian Assange saying, if we don't stand up for people like Julian Assange, it will be too late for the rest of us uh, when we find ourselves facing the same treatment. Um, another participant makes the point that cures and treatments would be discovered much faster uh, if all researchers were putting their data into central international database. This is impossible while scientists are hamstrung by profit-seeking pharmaceutical companies. Um, I guess that sort of goes back to the question from earlier, which was just asking how how would a global socialist government or what would a global socialist government do uh, to to uh, heed the threat of pandemics? 
Well, I think one of the questions touched on, you know, touched on that. Cures and treatments would be discovered if, uh, you know, the uh, were put into central data. It's not that we didn't know about this pandemic. Uh, let's look even at what's taken place. One of the reasons why, at least to this point, there's been some containment of the virus in uh, in uh, Asian countries to some extent is because they experienced the SARS virus and they put in they knew what measures to to take uh, to undertake. In the United States, there was a study of the SARS virus, its genetic structure, uh, and so on, and res vital research was carried out. But then. And such research, had it continued, would have played an important role in uh, quickly in more, you know, in discovering the structure of this virus and how to deal with it. But what happened in the US was that this whole research program was shut down. Well, size is gone. There's no bucks to be made in it, so we'll close it. That's what took place. So. How would and how could that develop through the enormous developments of of, of science? And there's a more broad question, a broader question here, that this question of science is very decisive because we know that the most important productive force in the world is not, uh, you know, is, is this uh, labour involved in scientific discoveries the development of the of the human brain the development of human capacities through the expansion of education university education the development of an educated population and out of that the development of scientists in all areas of life uh, and productive workers in all areas of life workers who will be able to make discoveries themselves to be able to contribute to the improvement of processes, who will have an input, who will think about and do think about what they are doing and how to better organise society and so on at all levels. That's the most important uh, question and that will lead to an enormous development of the productive forces and we will be able to conduct, uh, you know, the, against the threat of pandemics. It's not that this pandemic was some inevitable disaster, like the four horsemen of the apocalypse, that was unable to be prevented. There's no question that had study been conducted, developed, there were certain warnings about, about what was going to happen, as I accounted. For the last 20 years, there have been warnings, and more, there's been warnings about this. But what it requires, and as those warnings are made, it requires the conscious development and organisation of society to meet those threats, to establish what are the threats, how could they develop, what remedial action must be taken, how can such pandemics be prevented, how can the development of such viruses be combated, what's the necessary research that has to be carried out to ensure that this doesn't happen. But none of that is done and was done. Scientific research has been cut back. University education has been cut. Uh, everything is subordinated to the uh, to the interests and dictates of profit, above all to the major, you know, pharmaceutical companies and others. Well, I think that it's clear that there is, you know, a lot of discussion and, and interest in in these questions, um, and there are still sort of questions and comments coming through and, and working through the... Well, let's take them then. Um, but, uh, I mean, it's dealing with these main issues which we've dealt with before, and clearly there needs to be more. Um, there's a lot more that one can discuss and, and work through, and, and that's um, the purpose of these meetings is really to develop, begin, develop this discussion on fundamental um, you know, theoretical, historical, political questions of perspective that confront uh, the working class and young people. Um, and so this is, this is, as we said, the first in a series of lectures that will be held uh, every week uh, for four weeks. So there's four lectures uh, that are lined up every Tuesday at 7 p.m. 
uh, using the same link. Uh, the next lecture is entitled The Russian Revolution Was Stalinism Inevitable? Um, and this will be uh, to discuss, of course, the major you know, questions relating to, to the Russian Revolution, of which all of these questions really are, are related and draw down into. Um, we will also be having, or the IYSSC will also be having a series uh, of club uh, hosted meetings. So Victoria University is having a meeting this Friday at 1 p.m. The University of Newcastle will also be meeting on Friday at 1 p.m. And there will be a combined meeting of WSU, Macquarie University and UNSW in Sydney uh, on Monday at 1 p.m. All these meetings will be online. Um, now, in order to take part in, in these meetings, if you are not already a contact of the SEP and the IYSSE, I urge you to uh, go to sep.org.au slash website slash about slash get dash involved. Um, the link is in the chat field, uh, which again is just a little speech bubble that you can find on your screen. Uh, fill out the form uh, in order to take part in and receive you know, emails about further meetings. Uh, before we conclude tonight, though, I wanted to make a uh, appeal uh, for, to you to uh, make a donation to the Socialist Equality Party um, monthly fund, uh, which is a, a $25,000 fund that is required to really raise everything that we are doing in this period. I think as is clear, the outbreak of the coronavirus and the incompetent responses from governments really has meant uh, that we need to, to change our work and our methods of work. This means new um, experiences, new costs, including these meetings themselves. Um, although it is carried out online, it does require a cost for the software. Um, so the SEP you know, really receives no funding from the government or from any corporate donations. We rely and we always have relied uh, on the sacrifices of workers and young people such as yourself. So we'll ask you uh, if you can uh, to make, well, we ask you to make as generous a donation as you can to assist in the building of the Socialist Equality Party. Um, the donation can be made to the Socialist Equality Party directly if you are a resident of Australia. Um, that's at sep.org.au slash website slash donate. However, if you are one of the participants who is taking part from overseas or you're not a resident, uh, please make a donation to wsws.org slash donate. Uh, all donations and, uh, and income is very much appreciated and needed in this time of changes and, and upheavals. Finally, if you have not uh, done so already, I urge you to uh, make the most important decision of uh, your life and apply to join the Socialist Equality Party and join its youth wing, the International Youth and Students for Social Equality, and take up the fight for socialism. The link for that, as uh, we have indicated, is in the chat field, but it is also there on the screen, sep.org.au slash website slash about slash get involved. Um, thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you for your questions. Hang, and we will... Hang on, Zach, before you go, can I yeah. just... Uh... Sure raise a couple of couple of points. Firstly, there'll be five lectures. The next one will deal with the Russian Revolution. Very vital questions have been raised tonight. And I just make the point that I made, I think, in the course of discussion tonight. We are now in the... This is not a question of sort of some abstract historical discussion, because we are now in the situation that produced the Russian Revolution and produced the mass struggles for socialism Early, in earlier periods. We can now directly experience why that was necessary. The next, the third lecture will deal with the politics of the pseudo left, a question that has been raised tonight and we'll be able to go into it in further detail. The fourth lecture will deal with the very, very vital a campaign of our party in the United States in the heart of the beast for the presidential uh, elections. Um, and we will take up there in particular, among many other things, the question of Bernie Sanders and the lessons that must be drawn from that experience, vital lessons 
for the struggles that we're now undertaking. And the last, the fifth lecture will be dealing with one of the more pernicious forms of capitalist ideology that has been developed in the past period. Uh, identity politics bound up with some of the questions that were raised tonight about does the working class exist? Can you base a perspective on the working class or do you have to base a perspective on race, sexual identity uh, and so on and so forth? And what the implications of this sort of perspective really are and what interests it serves. So these questions are, are vitally uh, necessary to develop you know, a political uh, orientation. So uh, I hope, I thank you for your attendance today uh, and we hope to see you again in the course of these lectures uh, developing uh, the next four that will be coming up. Thank you very much. And from me, uh, thank you to Nick uh, for the lecture and thank you to the participants for all your questions and Nick to the answers. Um, I've uh, put in the chat field again the links to both uh, join uh, and to give us your contact details as well as to donate. Uh, so thank you everyone and we will see you all next week, seven o'clock.